This episode of Legends and Losers is brought to you by our friends at Oracle NetSuite. Learn how to grow your business at netsuite.com slash legends. Today, we have a real conversation about how new technology is unraveling massive mega industries and categories, why size and scale are actually a liability, and how you can benefit from becoming unscaled with my friend, the incredible author, Kevin Maney. All right, all right, all right. Joey Ramone said, hey ho, let's go. Hello, my legendary friends. Welcome to this fantastic episode of Legends and Losers. And man, am I ever glad you joined us. As I said off the top, uh, Kevin Bainey is our guest. He, we have a riveting dialogue um, centered around his new book, which I'll tell you about in a second. If you're a new listener to Legends and Losers, thank you so much for joining us. This is not your typical interview show. This is what you could think of as a um, authentic dialogue show. We strive to have real conversations about what it takes to actually design a legendary business and a legendary life. And we aspire to do that with great people who are willing to unpack the reality of the journey, the struggle that we all face, our battle, our personal battles in our lives and in our businesses with our own ability to be legendary and our ability to be losers. Now, you might have heard something different off the top if you're a longtime uh, listener, and that was our shout out to our uh, new sponsor, NetSuite. So here's the big news. As you know, Legends and Losers is, is a labor of love for all of us here. And um, we're a little bit over a year old now. And uh, candidly, we didn't know if we'd ever take on sponsorship. And uh, one day, our good friends at NetSuite, um, my buddy Jason Maynard and his team, uh, came and said, hey, listen, we love what you're doing with the show. We think we share a mission with you, and we'd love to be your founding uh, sponsor. And if you're a longtime listener, you may remember last year, I did a great speaking tour with, uh, with the folks at NetSuite, and we went um, all around the U.S., and uh, we went to Canada and Toronto and talk to a lot of people about um, the topics that we talk about on Legends and Losers, and of course, category design, how to design and dominate your own space. And that went incredibly well. And the thing I love about NetSuite is uh, they share our mission. Uh, and this is really why I wanted to bring them on. Um, we are at an all-time low in entrepreneurship in America. According to the Wall Street Journal, we have a crisis of American entrepreneurship. Millennials are on track to be the least entrepreneurial generation in American history, and more companies die every week in the U.S. than are, started, than are founded. And so, uh, as you know, I'm on a mission to try to make a difference um, in helping people design a legendary life and a legendary business. And uh, really, that means focusing on empowering entrepreneurs uh, to, to grow and to spark new entrepreneurship. And um, the folks at NetSuite, that's really what they are. They are the business platform for growing companies, a business management platform that gives you real-time visibility into all the operations of your business, allowing you the one source of truth for expenses, customers, orders, and even HR. And the other thing I'm excited about with our partnership with our friends at NetSuite is they're going to be doing a lot of thought leadership and they're going to be using a whole bunch of legends and losers, uh, either direct content or inspired content with a whole bunch of the um, thought leadership that they're planning going forward. And they're a huge support of our, uh, uh, my existing book, Play Bigger, and the new book that we have coming out called Niche Down. And so it really is a true partnership in that regard. And, um, you know, listen, we're a year old. It's time to put on our uh, big kid pants, take on a sponsor, and uh, become a real, uh, <laughs> a real podcast. So uh, for listeners of Legends and Losers, our good friends at NetSuite are uh, providing a, um, a free 60-minute business strategy review with a growth expert in your industry. So to get your free growth review, Go to netsuite.com slash legends and they'll set you up. All right, my dear friend, Kevin Maney. Uh, Kevin is a best-selling author, an award-winning columnist. Uh, he's been writing for over 30 years. He's interviewed virtually all of the leading tech pioneers you could think of. He was a longtime columnist for Newsweek, a longtime uh, a journalist with uh, USA Today. Um, he's written uh, a ton of great books. Uh, the Two Second Advantage, which was a New York Times bestseller. Um, he co-wrote a wonderful book called Making the World Work Better, uh, Trade-Off, Why Some Things Catch On and Others Don't, uh, a book that many consider to be the classic on IBM called The Maverick and His Machine. And of course, he co-authored with me, Al Ramadan and Dave Peterson, 
the quote unquote instant classic for HarperCollins, Play Bigger, How Pirates, Dreamers, and Innovators Create and Dominate Markets. Now, he's got a new book coming out right now uh, with his co-author, Hamont Tanea, who is the founder of a uh, venture capital firm, General Catalyst. And the new book is called Unscaled, and it is amazing. Uh, one of my favorite reads. Now, look, I know I'm biased, okay? But this is a very smart book by two very smart guys. And it really, they talk about what you could think of as the atomization of everything and how modern technology is actually tilting the advantage for you and I as individuals and for startups and uh, entrepreneurs um, because technology is allowing us to do things we never could before. It's allowing us to niche down and it's allowing us to create incredibly powerful businesses that can design and dominate market categories that in the past, uh, never would have been possible. Uh, so here he is, my conversation with the almighty Kevin Maney. I mean, lot, certainly lots to talk about, but um, I don't know, where do you want to start? Um, well, I have a book coming out in uh, like, what, one month from now. Well, and we'll, we'll triangulate this so that it, 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 it launches or the show launches around when, uh, when your book comes out. Mm -hmm. That'd be good. So, you really did do it again. This is a fucking good book. Thank you. I mean, I didn't read every single word, but I mean, I took a good hard read at this book. Uh, it's, it's a little mm -hmm. bit tougher for me without the audio book. I found now, you know, now doing Legends and Losers last year, I probably consumed, I don't know, 30, 35 books, mm -hmm. you know? And so yeah, that's right, a right. lot of books for me. And yeah. so I found this new technique, which is actually very cool, which is, I get the audio version and the physical version and I uh, consume both simultaneously mm -hmm. and I can, that way I can make my notes, I can do stuff. And when my dyslexic brain takes me to outer space and I see zebras or naked ladies or whatever it is, um, the audio is obviously still going and it, it brings me straight back. Um, but that said, not having the audio, you know, um, it's very, it was very compelling. I mean, it, it held me and there's some very big, big, big shit in here. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Good. You know, the last book I did was, was all right too. Well, the last book you wrote, I think might be one of the greatest <laughs> books of all time. I think so. <laughs> and by the way, hard to compete with that one. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good book. This is a really, really, I think, big uh, idea because it's the opposite of what a lot of people have said historically, I think. Um, well, I, I, I do think that it's a, well, um, let, me, let me wind back a little bit. Um, the, uh, uh, what, how this came to be is, hey, Montanasia is the um, guy who runs General Catalyst, which is a, you know, fast growing venture capital firm in Silicon Valley. Um, and I met him maybe like four or five years ago for the first time. And uh, um, the first time we sat down, we had, a, we had a beer in New York and he started talking about um, how uh, he had this sort of semi formed idea about unscaling, um, which was, you know, this is just sort of basically this idea that, um, that the big opportunities right now for him as an investor are uh, companies that were were attacking the old scale, scaled up entities, whether that ends up being, so he's on the board of Khan Academy, um, and whether that ends up being something like Khan uh, taking apart the scaled up you know, university of old, or whether it's um, something like Honest Company, which was this you know, company that started out making diapers, attacking this one piece of Procter & Gamble, a giant scale up company. And those were the opportunities we're looking for. And I thought this was a really interesting theory and, and we just kept talking about it for years. And I ended up writing a few Newsweek columns that were based on some of those ideas. And it was just was one point when he said, you know, hey, do you ever think about maybe you and I should write a book about this? And uh, it's kind of actually kind of like the conversation with you and Alan Dave long ago. Yeah. Uh, you know, hey, well, let's, maybe this is a book. Okay, let's maybe see if it is. Book here. Yeah. <laughs> and we started exploring it. And, um, and once, um, once we started to like really tease out the ideas and, uh, and and you know structure them. I think that was when both of us realized that there was a there was a much bigger thing here than just a investment theory. That there was a there was a grand idea about like how the economy is changing. Yeah. So uh, why don't we, in the parlance of our times, unpack 
you know, what does unscaled mean? And uh, you guys have some pretty profound thoughts uh, about the economy that, you know, I've heard a little bit rumblings around Silicon Valley of somewhat similar thoughts, but uh, I think you guys have codified it in a way that uh, certainly I had never seen or heard or, or, or read of before. Yeah, and that's the thing. You know, you, we're both friends with Mike Maples. I've heard Mike talk about some of these kinds of ideas. And, yeah. Uh, and there's and others, you know, it's not, I don't think we you, discovered. You and Mike Maples should write a book together too. <laughs> <laughs> he's brought that up but <laughs> um, come on mike he, yeah i know he's Get so off fucking him. busy uh, yeah exactly he's busy making money you know why write a book um but uh uh yeah you know i mean it's it's not like we we you know discovered the moon all of a sudden and nobody else had seen it before uh but i do think that we put a lot of pieces together in, in a way that makes a a grander picture sense maybe than, than other people have seen. So, um, uh, the, the sort of historical way we ended up looking at this was said, if you, if you look at this remarkable 30 year period from the end of the 19th century, to the beginning of the 20th century, uh, right around that turn of the century, that was when we electrified the nation or the world, invented cars, invented airplanes, um, telephone telegraph all those things kind of came all at, at one particular moment in time so that um it, in a really dramatic way life at the end of the 1800s was completely different than life in the night you know by 1920 and um and so in a 20-year period we got to your point electricity we got cars what else do we get is that when we got refrigeration i think that's around that time is it yeah no, well yeah electric yeah, of course electricity was driving refrigeration so yeah uh, that was that was something in there too and the air conditioner all those things isn't that when our friend clarence bird's eye got his big idea about frozen food was in the 1920s yeah. based based on yeah, it sort of and it, it is interesting that um when big innovation bursts like this happen then there's the trickle down effect right so when you invent the automobile and you invent electricity and you invent refrigeration, then bird's eye can invent frozen food, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So there's inventions and innovations and then of course new categories on top of inventions and innovations and new categories. Yeah, right, exactly. And, and then, so you uh, guys have a premise that the time we're living in is, is much like that time. Right, well, so one important thing about all those, all those inventions from around that time is that um, they, they created the conditions that you could scale something up. Um, because if you didn't have electricity or a way to move products around by roads and cars, you can't scale up a giant corporation, a giant factory, right? It doesn't, doesn't happen. Um, but all these technologies made it possible to create scale. And, uh, and that set in motion this idea of economies of scale that, that uh, and in fact, the goal, the, the ultimate goal of any business in the 20th century was if, if you could make the, um, what you know one thing for the most people you know you could make the biggest profits on it and um so we that's that drove mass production and mass distribution and ma mass media and mass markets i mean that was the way we thought about business in the 20th century so yeah to your point chris is we're saying that um right around now we're probably you know we're saying we're like about 10 years into one of these other 20 to 30 year bursts and um and we're, and so I, I hate to interrupt you, Kev, but I'm gonna. Uh, so you guys don't uh, uh, sort of put in this innovation burst, or how you tell me how how I should think of it. But you don't put the '90s and the commercialization of the internet. You 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 start a little bit later than that. Am I remembering that right? We do. Yeah. Um, the, now that was that was important and laid the groundwork. And I think back, if you look back at the um, the beginning of the 20th century electricity itself was you know that was um you know electric the electric light bulb was invented quite a bit before that burst but there was this um period it, it, not until the turn of the century did we like literally figure out like how to use electricity to and and drive it into all sorts of products like refrigeration and all these other things and actually you know um, use it as a as a transformational technology before that before that it just lit up light bulbs uh, yeah, and also there, it takes some time for some of this stuff to be cost effective at scale, right? I, the one that's been on my mind lately, my um, sister-in-law bought that my wife and I 
23 and me packets for, for oh, yeah. Christmas. Uh -huh. And I can't, do you remember what it cost to map the genome when, when Ventner, Craig Ventner did it? Oh, it's like bill, billions, billions of dollars. And, yeah. I mean, it was a gigantic amount of money. And I, I remember that was, I think 98 ish. Yeah. Something like that. You, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. And I remember at the time thinking, wow, this is awesome. We've now figured out the, the, the core code of life. And we now understand that like when you and I develop a disease, it's because our core code is misfiring. That is to say we have a bug and sooner or later we're going to be able to hack our own genomes and recompile the code and ta-da, we won't have cancer anymore. And, you know, that was, you know, there was a lot of talk about all that in the late 90s, early 2000s. And then, um, of course, it felt like, at least to me, I don't want to be critical of these researchers who did all this amazing work, but it felt like for like a few, like a decade or longer, certainly several years, not a lot happened. I'm sure they were working on shit, but not a lot that certainly I saw. And I, I can remember thinking kind of, I don't know, 2005-ish time frame, maybe even a little bit later than that. Like, where the fuck's all the innovation coming from mapping the genome? Right. And, and I'm just impatient, I guess. And so, but here we are, uh, you know, less than or plus or minus 20 years later, and you get a Christmas gift uh, uh, as your map genome. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Like, oh, well, I guess I shouldn't have been bitching around 2005 because they, they were really getting on it. It just you know, took a little bit longer than I thought. <laughs> yep. Yep. No, exactly. Um, and and uh, yeah, so some of these things do take a while to sort of get in the bloodstream, right? Essentially, the, the economy. Uh, but we're, we we kind of started at at uh, 2007. You start getting mobile, social, um, cloud all happening, um, and, uh, and and that in turn starts to create enormous amounts of data that drive artificial intelligence. Um, we start being able to and now and now we have we have blockchain, we have 3D printing, we have some really truly amazing uh, in, inventions that are are going to change the way we all do things, and um, if you look at them as a whole, um, you realize that uh, this group of inventions is uh, enabling something very different to this idea of scale. It's enabling like artificial intelligence software, it, you know, can understand you, Chris, as a consumer individually and, and at scale um, sell, you know, sell you and every, everybody else um, products and services that are actually geared exactly towards you. So it's not mass markets anymore. It's actually sort of like, like markets of one at a massive scale. Um, and it's, it starts to take apart this idea of economies of scale, which is why we call this hub scale. It's, it's, it's just, it's sort of the opposite of economies of scale. It's more like economies of one at scale. And, and it's a very different kind of business model. And so we envision a world where uh, you tell me what the right um, right analogy is. That the one that comes to mind for me is food, because all of us are all of our bodies are different, and uh, you know we, our 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 nutrition requirements have have some variability from person to person. And so there's a paradigm emerging here where food companies could purpose build food, so to speak, if I can use that lingo, for Kevin. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, well, so you brought up, you know, you brought up, um, you know, DNA and, and, and healthcare and all of that. And, and that's, I mean, healthcare is, you know, going to be massively affected by this. Um, you know, healthcare so far has really been a mass market product, right? You know, you have a giant hospital and you have, uh, um, you know, uh, and, and, and so we write about in the book, we write about diabetes. Diabetes is an interesting disease to look at because right now the diabetes is considered there's type one and there's type two. And, and you have one or the other, and you're, the treatment that you're going to get for one or the other is pretty much the same as everybody else who's got one or the other. But every person's diabetes is completely different. So you start to get um, this company we wrote about uh, in the book called Livongo. And there's a lot of other ones that are kind of like this. But So Livongo sends you a, a little cloud-connected device that can take your blood sugar reading. Uh, and it also is an interactive thing where it's like it's got a screen it can it can ask you questions during the day like are you are you are you tired are you um, happy are you you know are you hungry and it, by answering these questions and looking at your blood sugar and and sending the data back to Livongo's database that device or that 
that service starts to get to know your individual patterns about diabetes and then starts to be able to, um, to gear treatment towards you as an individual. It tells you, helps you t manage diabetes by telling you what to do at certain times so that you actually avoid the problems. And at the other end, if, there, if, some, if it notices a pattern that suggests you're about to have some kind of an episode, it will actually call a doctor on the other end and connect you. So it starts to make the treatment of diabetes geared towards you as an individual, and it actually, it actually takes it out of the giant hospital, which is kind of like a giant medical factory, right? It takes it out of that and puts it into your hands as an individual um, and, and essentially unscales that particular service from, you know, from the old way we used to do it. So that's like just one example. Well, and the thing I find fascinating about that in healthcare is, you know, there's this new emerging category of healthcare uh, people are calling functional medicine. And if I understand it well, properly, and I've just been trying to educate myself, but if I understand it properly, the idea is just like um, functional movement in, in sports, which has been a huge thing, is, is to sort of look at the whole person, so to speak, you know, the quote unquote holistic person, and to look at all the potential causes and, 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 and not just treat symptoms, which we do for a lot of these diseases, including diabetes, right? And so mm -hmm. look at diet, look at exercise, look at lifestyle, um, and so on. And so the interesting thing about what you're saying is the ability uh, to consume a, tr a tremendous amount of data, to have personal data, to compare our personal data against all kinds of other people who've had diabetes, uh, to work with a medical professional who's not just going to look at prescription drugs, but it's going to look at lifestyle and diet and and of course, their blockchain opens up all kinds of fascinating things around uh, medicine and diet and so forth that we can talk mm -hmm. about maybe if you want. But, but the thing that gets me excited, I guess, is if, if you think this idea of functional medicine, that is to say, we got to look at everything about the person and not just treat symptoms, but look at what is it in their lifestyle. Uh, you know, the average mm -hmm. American doesn't get, I think the average American gets six hours of sleep. So mm -hmm. like we know that that increases the likelihood of disease, right? And, and on and on. And so I guess my point is there's all these causes and effects for our well-being that no one doctor can process in their head. And, mm -hmm. and we need a lot of data and analytics and AI and all the good shit, right? Um, but when you bring all of that to bear, you can really zero in on, okay, well, if you increased your exercise by X amount and you did these things in your diet, and, and there's, there's probably, you know, um, some, some meds you need to take. Uh, we can deal with your diabetes in a way that was not even imaginable before. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. Yep. And so you see custom drugs in this unscaled yeah. world? Oh, absolutely. Well, absolutely. And that gets back to the genome. I mean, if we could, we could, if we can sequence your genome very, very cheaply, um, can start to um, understand what drugs are going to, you know, act best on you as an individual, um, and then it, you know, and then if you start having um, the ability to, uh, you know, to 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 instantly manufacture, you know, a, a drug with a different set of dosages or whatever, and send that to you, I mean, then, you, then you're just getting you're getting medicine that's made just for you, not for anyone else. Well, and the thing I something. wonder, I don't know, I've been learning more and more about uh, 3D printing. Mm -hmm. And if we can 3D print food, uh, will we be able to 3D print a drug? Well, well sure. I mean, that's, that's do, certainly... Do pharmacies go away because I now have this unscaled, personalized uh, uh, approach to healthcare. We're doing it from a quote-unquote functional medicine point of view. So we're not just, you know, we're doing the whole person, diet, exercise, every environment, et cetera, et cetera. And so if we're, we got all that going... Uh, we 3D print the food and we 3D print the, 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 the drugs so that we can get ourselves healthy. Is, I mean, is that, do you see that? I, I'm asking this as a question. I'm curious. Yeah. No, well, well um, so here's the thing about 3D printing that, that, I, that we concluded um, in it and, uh, and, and, you know, using our model here in the book. Um, I think a lot of people think about 3D printing and think you're going to have this like device in your home, like a, like a paper printer 
that you just decide I want to stay, you know, I want a steak or I want some Advil or whatever. You put a few buttons and this thing makes it. Um, that's not likely to happen in any foreseeable future. But what is likely to happen, you brought up, will there still be pharmacies? What is likely to happen is that there's that CVS is not going to have a big store of of pills sitting on shelves that were that, that were made for everyone. What CVS is going to have in the back room are a handful of specialized 3D printers uh, that have the ingredients, like the probably regulated ingredients that go into drugs that you could put in there and mix to you know make. So, and I will t I will tell you a point that I I really kind of enjoy that we bring up in the book. Um, if you think about life before scale, before the 1880s, um, we, we, we lived in a way that was much more personal and personalized, right? We lived in a small town. And when you wanted to get drugs, you went to a pharmacist who had a bunch of concoctions in the back and mixed them up for you, right? And, and you know, the hammer and pistol thing, right? Did all that and, yeah. and made a drug for you. Um, and and, and uh, that's indicative of a lot of things that we think are going to happen that essentially take us back to the way we lived before scale. Um, so that be, when, when people knew their customers and actually tailored things specifically for them, where, when you didn't buy mass market clothing, but you went to somebody who was going to make something that fit you personally. Uh, and that's, we're returning to that, but we're returning to that in a way that's automated so that you know, so that it could still be, it could be done profitably and, and not, not be a craftsman thing, but actually be a, a business. And also be a lot more uh, technology forward and savvy and so forth. Right. And so yeah. I got to believe in this unskilled future. If we go back to the uh, going to CVS and getting the, the drugs that are purpose built for Kevin Maney, the, the dude or dudette uh, mixing up the elixir shit, you know, in the cave <laughs> or, or, or right next to the saloon in the jail, you know, whatever this to wherever you, however far back in the day you want to go. Uh, you know, I mean, shit, I'm, I'm sure there were, you know, certain mushrooms and if you lick this rock, it'll all be okay or whatever that, that were wonderful back then. And, you know, some of that shit is still around and sometimes we discover that shit and whatever, whatever. But all that said, I got to believe the new shit's going to be better than the, you know, a list yeah, yeah, yeah. That the witch doctor right. gave you, right? My, my well, big again, question. That, is, sorry, go ahead. No, no. So again, instead of it, it you know, you know, it, the but that pill that gets made in the back of the CVS will will be based on you know on your DNA, on data about you know about your entire medical history, um, you know, maybe data from your your Fitbit or activity tracker or whatever. So you know that that pill that gets made there. Is taking in all of that um, and making something that is that is likely to be highly effective for you. It's not going to be like here's here's a frog to lick and see yeah. what happens. <laughs> see, see, now, now you know only three out of ten people die, but the ten, you know, the other the other seven are awesome. I I, I do have another question, which is, will you still want to commit suicide when you walk into a CVS? <laughs> well, only when the line is like thirty people deep, right? Fuck. <laughs> You know, I, I, I like, you know, I, I hope Amazon does something here be, or, or fucking somebody because the pharmacy space needs transformation more than any retail space I can think of. You want, I guess we're, I don't know if we're allowed to talk about Louis CK anymore. Uh, I can't watch <laughs> it. I, I can't watch his shit anymore. He's one of my favorite comedians. I can't watch it. It's, I'm really, uh, you know, I'm angry at what he did. And I'm also angry at the fact that I don't get to enjoy his comedy, but he did have this hysterical bit about CVS and how much it sucked. And in there, you know, and as a marketing guy, I particularly love this. He says, you know, their new slogan should be CVS. Sometimes you just have to come in here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Well, you know, and, and actually this is, this is a little, it's off topic, but, but uh, I mean, as you probably know, I mean, that seems to, there's a whole lot of companies attacking that right now. There's a bunch yeah. of startups. No, I, uh, I can't I, wait. I'm very, very excited. So if too. I think about this unscaled world, particularly in the domain we're talking about, which is food and healthcare and, and so forth, it is, it's probably not the case in, in other areas. We can talk about that too, but what we're really enabling or empowering is, uh, 
either me to hack me or medical professionals or providers or experts of one sort or another to, to hack me such that they can help me. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, uh, that's, and you brought, you know, you brought up, uh, so there's, you know, obviously uh, one of the things that's sort of in the, in the ether right now are, um, you know, a lot of, a lot more concerns maybe than ever about privacy and about, um, you know, what, what does Facebook know about me and Google and everything else. Um, you brought up a minute ago blockchain. I think one of the biggest impacts of blockchain is going to be on, um, on, on privacy in this, in this age of being able to provide enough data to, for someone to hack you. Because right now, if you do that, um, you lose control of it, right? You, you, you agree to give, you know, all your data to some healthcare entity or to Facebook or Amazon and, and you don't know what it, what it is or what they've got or what they figured out about you or what the, I mean, my Alexa behind me somewhere, what it's listening to as I go about my day. Um, are those but bastards if, at Amazon gonna gonna just launch this podcast before we do to beat us to the exactly. <laughs> Alexa is currently recording everything we say? I, I think so. It's right behind me. <laughs> and uh, but um, uh, but there's there's potential solutions where um, our, we we are able to let all of our data, whether it's our genetic data, our activity data, our shopping history, everything else, um, going to uh, essentially like this black box that's on the blockchain um, with our individual ability to say, I'm going to give this amount of data to this, you know, this entity because to, to, you know, figure this out, I'm going to sell my, uh, my data to Facebook. I'm not giving it to them anymore. I'm going to sell it to them. Um, and uh, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and it have, it's going to have, a, I think that's going to have a, a, a huge impact. Um, it's, it's going to take some time, but we're all going to look at privacy in a completely different way. And blockchain is going to be a solution. You know, you, as you're talking, I'm sort of the, the, a, a light went off in my head. Uh, do you remember this term DRM digital rights management yeah. from, you know, as, as yeah. all the, you know, particularly music and, and video and all that was getting on the internet. There was a huge concern about exactly this, and of course, you know, we had Napster and all. You know, it, it, the the nightmare of the 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 quote rights holders came true in a lot of ways. But anyway, as you're talking, what I'm what I, so I guess maybe this is a question: is, is blockchain chain personal DRM on steroids? Is that what you're telling me? That's a good way to put it. Yeah, it is. Okay, and, and that's fucking cool right there, because <laughs> I'll tell you. I, I listen. I love my sister-in-law Mary like as much as anybody in the world, and of course you know Mary well. I know Mary, and so she gave Carrie and I this this fucking twenty-three and Me stuff. I haven't done that shit. I don't want those fucking people having my shit. That's, <laughs> and, and look, I can't even tell you why it scares the shit out of me, but I just know that Putin. And WikiLeaks are hacking everything. And I also know, I mean, we've now found out, and, you know, we don't have to have a political conversation, of course, but um, that our government is tracking shit in a way that we never understood. And that's only what we understand. You know, there may be a bunch of shit that has gone on since, uh, is it Souden or Snowden or Snowden? Great, Snowden, yeah. Snowden? You know, since since he kind of exposed that stuff, whether you hate him or you love him, whatever you think of him, the net of it is he exposed the fact that the government's tracking all of our fucking communications. And so I just wonder what else are they fucking tracking? And so, look, maybe I'm a crazy paranoid fuck, but I just can't quite get my so no Alexa in my fuck house and no 23 in me because uh, that that shit scares me because this blockchain DRM capability of my data doesn't exist right no it doesn't it doesn't i mean that is true you 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 so i did the i did it with ancestry.com and uh, but you know you you do it with your full knowledge that i just gave my i just gave my genetic code to, to ancestry.com i don't know what they're going to do with it well of course the only way these things can work is if we all agree because it's got to have it's got to be a network right because if you compare my genome to nobody's then fucking a nothing happens right so it's right. I, i'm not a I'm not a complete idiot. I understand it's the network effect that makes Ancestry and 23andMe and these things work. 
But to your point, yeah, you, you fucking sign. Look, whenever we download a piece of software, we just hit agree and keep going, right? So like, right, right. Did, did you read the 4,000 page fucking legal <laughs> document? Uh, of course you didn't. And so who knows what they have the right to do? They probably have the right to do anything they fucking want. And yeah. so I, I can't quite tell you why that scares the shit out of me, but why doesn't it scare you? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm just not as smart as you. <laughs> oh, no, we know who the smart one is in this conversation. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, uh, just to, to go tangential to that a little bit, it's something that, you know, you and I care a lot about is music, right? And, yeah. uh, and, and, and um, this very same thing, I mean, this, this DRM idea, um, you know, when you start, to, a blockchain seems to be a, a, an interesting solution for music um, is right, you know, the music the business has been decimated because people just, you know, listen to it on YouTube for free and artists don't get anything and all that. But uh, blockchain may be a way uh, for artists to put a song on the blockchain. Um, and, and, you know, when you, when you listen to it, there's some like, you know, one, one hundredth of a cent or something like that. Every time you listen to a song, that's automatically going to get paid back to that artist. And it's, you know, and it's securely in that blockchain. So you can't listen to it without, without paying. Yeah. For it. There's no, there, pirating is not a possibility because it's right. locked on to the chain. <laughs> right. Right. So to speak. Right. right, right. And, and, I don't know what if, the right lingo is yet. And if somebody did copy it and, you know, and, and distribute it, um, and what, what somebody recently was telling me is that every, every copy of, let's say a song, every copy of a song could have one tiny little flaw in it uh, that nobody would be able to hear. Uh, but, uh, but if you, it, you know, it, but, it, and, and every, every, every version of the song, like every, every time you listen to the song, that flaw would be someplace else. Uh, but it does allow you to track that song. Like if somebody copied it and pasted it and spread it around it for, you know, without, without getting, paying for it, you would know um, because of that flaw, you would be able to track it back on the blockchain, right? And know exactly who would the last person was that pulled that out. And you know, you know, I can't I can't wait for that because the security application I'm I want to have happen in my life is the oh yeah, you fucking hacked my shit, you did bad shit to my technology shit. I'm gonna take you out. <laughs> right? So today security is all about defense. Yeah, I, I'm a person who believes in a strong offense is a legendary defense. I think defense is important, but I want, you know, just like if, if, if somebody throws a punch at me, I want to be able to slip that punch and now smash them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that I, I, I would like that. It, it, you steal <laughs> my shit on the internet, you asshole. I'm taking you out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that, you know, that would be fun for me. <laughs> and, and something's, I mean, something's has to um, happen because, you know, I mean, just every, every day there's another, you know, hack of like targets database of, you know, credit card numbers and social security numbers or whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that can't, that can't go on. Eventually people are going to, um, you know, are going to do what you're talking about. Like saying, like, I'm not going to give you any of my information. Forget that. And then, and then, then we're stuck. Well, the other thing too is um, you guys use the word personal a bunch in the book. And I really mm -hmm. want to get to the last chapter because that was actually my favorite chapter in the book. And, and a very, with all the talk about solopreneurs and youpreneurs and all of that, you, you tweaked my brain about that, you know, at the end of your, at the end of unscaled in a way that nobody else has in a sort of a, I don't know, it was a, it's a, that's an idea that's been around for a very long time, but the way you guys put it, uh, uh, it, it, it rang in my brain in a completely, you know, different set of chimes, so to speak. Um, but uh, you guys really map out, you know, education, energy, healthcare. I mean, you really believe this um, unscaled mass personal capability is going to flow throughout not just the economy, but really all parts of our life. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think I, like education is an interesting one um, because uh, you know, uh, we, so Sal, Salcon who started Khan Academy is 
a good friend of Haymont's. He's on the board. Uh, like I said, he was one of the, he's helped fund it. So we spent actually a lot of time talking with Sal about his, you know, vision. And, you know, and Khan Academy started out just as basically YouTube videos. Um, and, you know, it's had a huge impact. But what, uh, what Sal's working on now is, uh, is adding AI to, um, to this whole process. So that if you're, you're a kid, you're taking one of these courses, um, it, 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 it starts to learn you like what what do you know what are you able to how what's what speech can you go at what concepts are hard for you what concepts are easy and, and over time as this as a system like that gets to know you um then it can start presenting material to you in the way that you're going to learn it best and at the speed you're going to learn it um you know challenge you just enough but not enough to make you frustrated and and so now um uh, over over time you can just play that out and you see that that these systems can give you an education that is that is built exactly for you, you know, rather than going into a university and sitting in a lecture hall with another thousand kids, um, getting the same, you know, the same information. So that's, I mean, that's, it's just going to happen over and over again in, in all different ways. And, and I got super excited about that part of, of, of your new book because, um, I'm somebody for whom the traditional education system, uh, didn't and doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I'm somebody for whom, you know, the only reason I got to grade 11 was because my mom found a, a, a school for elementary school and, and middle school and early high school that was 50% uh, music, art, and drama, be, which was incredibly important for me because it is the world of math and science and that shit was shutting uh, because of my dyslexia and dyscalculia and dis fucking... Fucklia, and I mean, I got. I, I found out now that I have like seven, six or seven of these fuck things. Anyways, <laughs> it's just fucklia. Just That's a real thing. No, I, I. Well, I just added them up because I got <laughs> dyslexia. I was writing about this on Cora recently. I find myself going on this bit of a jihad about learning because people call them disabilities, and they're not. This is why I'm excited about your book. They're learning differences. Mm -hmm. And we right. all have natural mental uh, assets and liabilities. Some of them are more extreme. With me, it's more extreme. I mean, you know, I have horrible liabilities that are a daily, often hourly pain in the ass. Uh, you know, but I got a couple of things that, you know, are pretty fucking awesome, right? And so, anyway, there's a long way of trying to fucking say, for the most part, our education system is... But boom, making hamburgers, right? Mm -hmm. And if the hamburger system doesn't work for you like it didn't work for me and like it doesn't work for, you know, easily 10%, and some people think it's quite a bit higher than that, forget dysphoclia, you know, it's just, you just happen to be more prone, you have more talent in this area, whatever it is, right? And so a standardized, you know, just think about how crazy it is, right? You want to go to law school, everybody takes the same fucking test. Right. Now, I understand, you know, I'm not completely stupid. I understand how we get there originally, which is we want to we have the same bar. I get that. But at the same time, like there are lawyers who are going to suck at the test who could be absolutely legendary lawyers. And, we, you know, we're never going to know that. We never got to have them as lawyers. Right. And so I get very, very excited about this. I, the other thing I think that's very powerful is – if we get to truly personalized education, then, so I found this out recently and I'm fucking insane mad about it. A lot of the school systems for kids with what I would prefer people call learning differences, uh, be, uh, because I think there's, huge a, there's a huge capability and not just a liability and nobody talks about that. Anyway, in order for them to get extra help, Kev, they have to be fucking classified with a disorder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And so in order to get the help they need to mitigate their uh, liabilities, and I would hope to, to begin to expand upon and amplify and build upon their assets, their capabilities, I don't know, maybe they never get to that, but even to get the help they need, they have to be labeled as fucking disabled. Yeah, right. And they're not. We have different brains. Mm -hmm. I mean, really different brains. You know, listen, if, 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 um, if when I 
started to learn to surf, I was terrible at it. People said, oh, you're terrible at this. You, you can't surf. Well, hey, I want to surf. <laughs> right? So, so fucking help me. Right? right? And so it's the same thing for the kid that, you know, needs help in the school system. And, and so I, my point is, we all have assets and liabilities. It makes me crazy that, that these kids are classified as having a disability or a disease or a disorder or whatever dysfuckia they want to call it. And in a world of personalized education where there's, we, we have evolved our thinking, if I could say it that way, that different people, to use your phrase, learn different ways. And we have intelligence based on these systems so that the system gets smarter and smarter and smarter about how Kevin best learns. I, as I'm sure you can hear in my voice, that's a very, very exciting idea. Yeah. No, it is. It is a very exciting idea. Um, and, it, and it will not only, I mean, it will, it will help, and it certainly will help everyone at every level. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's just, it's, I, I mean, I can't wait to see that happen, to be honest. Yeah. And like, I found, it's so interesting. I found as an adult, um, like I, as a kid, I got to a place where I hated school, mm -hmm. but as an adult, I love to learn. And the older I get and the more I learn, the more I think I love to learn. Like I'm somebody now who like, who, who walks around with an earbud in, like in one ear, a lot of the day, listening to mm -hmm. podcasts, listening to books. Uh, I just find my, my appetite for uh, consumption of shit I find interesting. Yeah, some of it's entertaining, no doubt. You know, some of it's sports. Uh, you know, so I don't know if that's making me a better human being, but uh, 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 but some of it are Kevin Maney books, right? And, and so I, I guess my point is, as an adult, sort of creating my own way of learning, learning how I like to learn for me. The more I figure that out, the more I want to learn. And I find that so fascinating because as a kid, well, I hate school, right? Yeah. And so it's, I guess what I'm trying to say is I am very excited about how much I love learning today like I never have mm -hmm. before. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Well, and, and, and one of the things that we point out in the book is that um, it starts to make this whole idea of us going to school until we're, you know, 21 or 22 and then stopping and you're done. And now you're going to, you're, you're baked and now you're going to like to live the rest of your life and figure it out on your own is, is pretty ridiculous. Um, and uh, what it said, like you, you're saying you, you, you love, you love to learn. Well, um, that's going to, increasingly be something you do throughout your life um, with these systems that, you know, that, that understand you and you, you, you know, you have a direction you want to go in. It can, you know, it can, it can figure out how to help you go in that direction. Um, and in fact, like uh, we're talking with Haymont, my, you know, co-author has a couple of, of school age kids and he's, uh, I mean, this is a brilliant guy who's, you know, what the, you know, has three degrees from MIT and all this stuff. And he's looking at college and going, I don't know if my makes sense for my kids. I, I read that in the book. I, I, I think, he, am I remembering this right? He sort of said something to the effect of maybe for his eldest child, who's sort of, I forget how old, I forget. Yeah, yeah I forget. She's, but yeah, but she's, she's like three years older than the other one. And he was saying like, by the, the time frames is that, you know, that by the time the oldest one is, it might not have changed enough and it, she still might need the college degree. But the second one, you know, maybe not. Maybe that's, maybe that one would never go to college and just would, instead engage in these sort of lifelong individualized, you know, tailored learning, uh, you know, and, and, and work and learn at the same time and build your life that way, which makes a lot of sense. Well, and even today, I mean, this is, this is where I get really excited because I'm excited about how it works today. I love that, you know, Professor Tina Selig has just put all of this insane content out on the internet for free and, and you know, so many others at Stanford and so many at MIT and Harvard. And I, I know there's many schools in Europe and around the world that are starting to put, you know, all kinds of content that uh, in the past you either had to be enrolled in a class or at, at a minimum a student to, to, to experience. And today that's less and less true. And then of course, all the TED Talks and 
all the incredible podcasts and and it's so easy today to self publish i think we you know so a lot of a lot some percent of the self publishing is complete crap but there's a lot of great you know and so if you're a smart person with something to contribute there are lots of ways to contribute that thing and you know you see it today with young people when they have a question about how to something they don't actually go to google they go to youtube and they type in how to whatever right, it is right, right? right. And, and like whatever the thing is, you know, how to fix a boat. Well, there's 50 at, at a minimum awesome fucking videos from dudes who just gave that knowledge away for free just because they, that's what they did. Yeah, right. Right. It's the wickification of fucking everything. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. I, you know, as you can tell, I find that incredibly exciting. And uh, the flip side of it, I, I always like to remind myself and others when I feel like they need reminding. There's no excuse for being stupid today. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. <laughs> there really isn't. You know, you got to have enough money to get like a smartphone. And, you know, okay, so that's a hurdle. And that's a hurdle for a lot of people outside the Western world. So I don't want to make light of that part. But that said, fucking A, if you live in the Western world and you're stupid, you're really stupid. <laughs> I like that. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> now, hey, I, 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 there's lots in here, but I also want to jump to the end. This, this, uh, this idea of the personal enterprise that you guys have, uh, mm -hmm. I, I think is really incredibly powerful. So can you expand upon this? And I have some notes in here too. I want to <laughs> this personal okay. enterprise business. I, I, and you, you know, you, you, so you know how it is when you work on a book, right? Like you, like, by the time you finish it and it's like six months later, by the time you're like actually talk, talking about it, that's going to go out somewhere. I'm going like, do I, can I remember what that chapter You got to reread that. <laughs> I got to reread the chapter. I, I have that problem with play bigger. You know, I'll be talking to people or they'll, they'll ask me about something in the book or, and I, and I got to say to them early on, Hey, listen, I'm not that smart. I consume a tremendous amount of scotch. And, uh, and that shit in those 270 pages for me, that's my life. And so I don't know what's in the book, what's not in the book, because it's all just my life. But ask me anything you want, and it may or may not refer to something in the book. <laughs> So it's, yeah. like, it's like that with every book. Is that what you're telling me, Kevin? I, yeah, I think so. Exactly. Exactly. But um, Well, I made notes if you don't remember. <laughs> what are your notes like? <laughs> okay. Let me... Let me uh, so uh, in the last chapter, I think this is the last chapter, chapter 11, uh, titled The Individual, Living Your Life as a Personal Enterprise. Right. So there's the discussion. Oh, yeah. Here's the discussion about college not necessarily being the best option. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you guys say, keep in, and this was the one that knocked me over. Keep in mind that the full-time job is not some natural state of human existence. And I had this aha, which of course you're giving me here. The, the full-time mm -hmm. job and the company man and the pension and that whole paradigm really only comes after in, uh, industrialization, right? Right, right. And, and so, you know, I, I didn't go back and look, but unions and pensions and, and, you know, this concept of a job for life and that shit. What year, what year do you think that starts? Um, I mean, it probably, well, probably starts at the end of the 1800s and it's really, but it's really, it's a 20th century construct. Yeah. Because I, I mean, I, I'm not, I, you know, I have read my history and stuff. I don't know that I'm any expert on any of it, but I, you know, I am fascinated by it, but I, I would, in my mind, it would sort of seem that it might have taken till the 30s for that to really sort of lock in as mm -hmm. a cultural like kaboom. I'm sure yeah. it started much earlier, but the 20s and 30s. And then, you know, if you go back and watch old TV shows from the 50s, you really can see it. It's this thing like, right. and you know, I grew up in a world where uh, many people's definition of success was quote, a good government job. Right. And so I, I guess all that is to say, I had never thought about how recent the, the idea that I would, you know, 
have a job and ha- you know have this long term relationship and and allow sort of my future and today what we might call career path or whatever to sort of be left up to this third party thing. Right, right. Well, to th- and and to go back to um, something we were just talking about a little while ago, um, to the way we lived life before um, the twentieth century, you didn't, you know, you you're if you were if you're a farmer or you know saloon keeper or whatever you were um, you didn't think about it as something you went in at nine o'clock in the morning and you checked out at five o'clock at night it was just it was your life it was just what you did and you, you did other things in between it and you know and, and your your life sort of just kind of evolved around the job and the job around your life and, and, and you know so the idea that we have the structured thing was all um is all a result of you know scale, mass production, mass markets, um, you know, assembly lines, and all, all all of that. And it doesn't; it's not natural. And 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 we're we're going to blow that up. Is what we're going to do. And over the so, next, so the 20. truth is, our, our natural state is uh, at a minimum a solopreneur. Right? I make baskets. Well, you yeah. got to make the baskets, and you got to source the shit for the raw materials for the baskets and you got to make sure they're quality and then you got to price and position the fucking baskets and then you got to sell them and maybe there's a distribution channel and per play bigger over time you position yourself in the center of an ecosystem and you get known as the basket gal or guy or what et cetera, Right. And it's like, I find that very, very empowering. We had this guy on legends and losers named Jordan French and I don't know exactly how old he is, but he's in his thirties, you know, handsome, dashing young man. And he's on all the lists, you know, the fast company, super ding dong, young guy list and an ink list and all those lists, right. Of the, like the cool kids in business today. And the, the fascinating thing about Jordan, well, he's on the staff at the street.com as a writer mm-hmm. and a journalist. He's an entrepreneur and this, he's, he's, one of the, he's, he's in one of these companies that does these crazy uh, 3D printing shit. And he's an advisor slash investor in a bunch of, or consultant, whatever the fuck he calls himself. And he walked me through a bunch of them. And, you know, as we're talking, I'm having an unscaled moment because he's a personal enterprise and he does a little bit of writing and he does a little bit of, if he has an idea, he helps start a company or whatever he does. And then he consults with other people. Oh, and he, he speaks. Yeah. He walked me through his fucking speaking schedule. So he's a, he gets paid to be a speaker and you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and at one point I said to him, Hey, uh, Jordan, there's no, no one at GE who has your job, right? <laughs> right. There's a listing on LinkedIn that describes that. <laughs> but the cool thing is, and you know, this, this goes to personal category design, which is, uh, some of us find our place in the world. You know, some people figure out that they're like really great at accounting and they go and they work for an accounting firm and then they become a partner at Price Waterhouse, and that really works for them. And that, and, and that's great. I don't have a pejorative thing about that at all. Fucking a, you know, my wife Carrie's like that and lots of people are like that, but then there's, mm-hmm those of us from the island of misfit toys and there is no place for us and we have to make a place regardless the thing that i found interesting and most empowering in this idea is um i want to live in a world where more of us feel like we're responsible for ourselves mm-hmm. yeah Be- because i think when we are i think we have uh I think we are better with us. And I think people who are uh, more self-reliant, more industrious, uh, who have more grit, who have more balls, who have been, who have walked through more fires and crawled through more glass. I think all those things are good. And I think that's how we, in in a large way, become self-actualized as human beings, overcoming Mm -hmm. struggle. And we live in a world today where, you know, there's less and less of that. So, I don't know. I got very clearly, very, very excited. Have I said enough about this shit that you remember what you wrote that you might? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so let, let me let me add a point to that. Is that um, now we we're, were talking about this, you know, um, this ability for the technology to understand individuals and what they want and what they don't want, and you know. So now, you, now you imagine 
we're, we're heading towards easily towards three, four billion being people being connected all over the world to the same essential network, right? Um, and so you as an individual, you have this one thing that you do really well, whether it's make those baskets or you or a podcast that you, you know, you do. Um, and what this system is go going to allow to happen is that um, you're now able to find enough people for your individual quirky thing to make it a, a worthwhile endeavor for you. Uh, because the, 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 da the data and the system is finding the individuals that um, are out there that, that want what you have and essentially connecting you to them. And if you, what do you need? If you need a, you need a million customers to make a hell of a great living, well, you know, a million out of the four billion people on the planet are just quirky enough to want whatever it is that you have. But and and before there was never a way to find them, but now yes. there's a way to find them and for them to find you. So you can be sitting there in Santa Cruz and find your market of a million. Um, you know, you, with it, with between AI and the networks that are out there um, all over the planet, you never could do that before. And and now that allows you as an individual to be this individual entrepreneur in a way that, uh, you know, it allows everybody to do that in ways that we couldn't do that before. And, you know, I, just the world I'm in right now, uh, podcasting, video casting, all of that, there are people who have gigantic podcasts mm -hmm. who, who blow away CNN. You know, if you look at the, right. really, the really big shows, if you look at the kind of numbers uh, some of the big NPR shows get, if you look at um, Adam Carolla, uh, uh, Rogan, Joe Rogan has said on his show that I, the number I remember is five, I think he says five to eight million downloads a show. Mm -hmm. wow. What, what yeah. fucking CNN show gets five yeah. million viewers? And, you know, that's a comedian smoking pot talking about fights with his buddies. <laughs> now, and by the way, I'm a fan. And he has some other shows that are not that, that are a lot more cerebral than that. So he's got a wide range of shit. But, like, the point is, you could create your own media company. You know, my, 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 friend, my friend Jason Maynard from NetSuite came to me and said, look, dude, I know you think you're just doing a podcast, uh, but I'm going to tell you what you've done. You're a media company, whether you like it or you, you don't. I don't, even, <laughs> uh -huh. you know, I'm, I don't even know what that means, but I'm, it, it, here's what I do know. It's changing my thinking about what we should and could do here around Legends and Losers because mm – -hmm. I think Jason's right, even though I have no idea what he or I are talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but to your point, right, it's a very, very exciting thing. And listen, there's some, uh, um, you know, to quote the, the, uh, the, uh, some of our new thinking that are niched down, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, this is in a very real way. Uh, allowing people to niche down to your point, because there's right. some niches where, you might find, I don't know, uh, 5,000 customers or 3,000 customers is, is what you need to make something go. You know, I, I met a guy in Las Vegas who rebuilds Jeep Wagoneers only with all <laughs> modern shit. He puts in like Corvette engines and shit and like all the <laughs> new brakes and, and the, you know, the new, all the new techno jazz and entertainment. Like he makes, he takes a Wagoneer and makes it a today car with a mm -hmm. 450 horsepower Corvette engine, right? Well, I don't know what the category potential for that is. <laughs> <laughs> but he, to your point, he has customers all around. He has customers in Asia and in the Middle East and, you know, and all over the place, right? Right. And yeah. so what got me really excited as I thought about this is that ability to uh, pick a micro niche that for a business that was in any way uh, dependent on physicality, right? That's all mm -hmm. gone now. You, you, you can be the Jeep Wagoneer guy in Las Vegas and make that shit for someone in Dubai and, that, and you can make that work. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And, 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 and there can be tens of thousands of, of, of that guy, right? Right, right. Yeah. Yep. So it's, a, it's, it's an interesting... And, you know, it doesn't mean that the idea of a... Of a of a company disappears, but company's going to mean something different, and it, and it might be more amorphous and more like uh, 
you know, like there's, I mean, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on right now. You probably, you know, you, we, we, we see all the stuff in the news about, you know, Bitcoin and IC, ICOs, you know, initial coin offerings and companies trying to fund themselves that way. Um, and essentially some of these, some of these are essentially companies without founders. I mean, they're, uh, they're, the company is basically a set of rules and software. It's basically like Wikipedia, like, but except that there's a mechanism installed to get to pay people and, you know, and understand who does what work. And, you know, Wikipedia is basically just all volunteer, but um, you think about that, it was basically a set of, it was something that was put in motion with a set of rules and now community takes over and, and does it. And it's the most, you know, biggest source of like, you know, font of knowledge in the, in the universe. Uh, so we're going to start to see entire companies built that way on the blockchain and the blockchain, the rules of the blockchain automatically know who does work and how to pay them, um, you know, and, and, and sets up the rules of like what this company, the company is trying to achieve and, you know, and, and all that and, and just sets it in motion and it goes and anybody can decide to join or, or drop out. Um, that's, you know, that's yeah. a version of the company of the future. At that, um, the company of the future is more like um, making a movie than what we understand as a company today. Right. Right. Yeah. There's, a, there's an assembly of, of people and resources that come together, produce a set of outcomes, and disband. And, you know, some, some percentage of them may stay together. But to your point, in this personal enterprise blockchain enabled world, um, there are these swarms or these flash mobs of work to produce outcomes. Mm -hmm. and, and look, it's, it, it happens today. I, as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, Carrie is, is um, as you know, an event planner. And this is essentially exactly what she does today. Mm -hmm. Because yep. if you say to her, okay, we're going to put together a 10,000 person uh, product launch in Las Vegas, she'll, knows how to get that done. If you say we're going to produce, we want a super ding dong executive event for a hundred people and you know, every other, every other thing in between those extremes. And she does all these, she likes to do these uh, sales clubs. You know, they take the mm -hmm. top five or 10% of sales force to, you know, some super ding dong location and she moves them up and all that. And so she likes to do those because, you know, they're big budget things and she can be super creative. And she always, if they're going to some, you know, beautiful place in the Caribbean or wherever, she, she likes to do things that are of the place. So it's mm -hmm. not unusual for her to buy shit from artisans, have them make something that's a gift or, you know, a piece of jewelry maybe or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. And so she goes out and she finds these people on the internet you know, she finds them on Etsy. Mm -hmm. And so she'll get, you know, she'll, she'll find somebody who makes uh, woodcraft or, you know, something in, in yeah, hate. Right. I don't know what the fuck, you know what I'm talking about. No, and, no, so, exactly. yeah. and so the interesting thing is you're talking, I'm thinking about, yeah, you know, she's already doing that. And so what happens in our world when that's the norm? Mm -hmm. yeah. As opposed to going to, you know, the mall or, or even going to Amazon for that matter. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I'm sure like, like anything else, it's not going to be like some, some, uh, giant earthquake that, you know, creates a demarcation and suddenly like all the companies in the world disappear. I mean, it's going to be something that happens a little, a little over time and, you know, there'll be a blend of different ways to do things, but certainly that's going to be an increasingly viable way to, uh, you know, create wealth, create products, do innovations, you know, um, whatever, you know, whatever else, make movies, make art. It's, yeah. it's going to be these kinds of uh, constantly flowing sets of people. Yeah. yeah and and it, the degree to which it's already happening, it's the, 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 um, the, the future is uh, nipping at our heels. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. 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 <laughs> Well, yeah. uh, Kev, I, I love it. This is a great piece of work. No, no surprise. Uh, you know, it's not as good as play bigger, but Hey, what, you know, what well, could be, what could it, be, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> 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 Anything else before we uh, kick out of this one? Uh, no, I mean, I'm, I'm good. Things, life is good. And, um, you know, get, uh, 
as 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 usual, get this this book out and uh, got to figure out the next one and move on. And so, are you? Uh, you know, last time we talked, you've been doing a lot of category design consulting, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. so, are uh, you are you thinking like you're going to be a full time category designer now, or are we will we see more Kevin books, or how how are you how are you thinking about your future? Well, I, you know, I I. I I, I like doing that. I've enjoyed working, you know, with companies and trying to take them through what what we describe. Um, but you know, ultimately, um, I mean, my sort of my identity and my superpower is as a writer. It's not, you know, it's not going to ever be uh, something else. So you know, sooner or later, we you know, I'll like, you know, get back to that and you know, get uh, get the next one going. Does it, and if you, if you hate me for asking, then just kick me under the, the digital table. Um, is it weird not being associated with Newsweek? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, the, um, uh, it, was, it, was a great, it was a great run. Uh, you were there a the long editor, time, weren't you? About four and a half years, yeah. From, oh, I thought the, it was from, longer than that. Well, it was, it was about four and a half years ago that um, the new group, that just because now the scandal written group, but the, the new group, the new owners bought Newsweek um, and then hired um, uh, Jim and Poco, who was uh, the, the original letter that they hired. And Jim was, you know, he's one of the greats in, in business, um, especially in the business world of uh, business journalism. He used to be at Fortune and New York Times Magazine. Um, he was with me at Portfolio, Condé Nast Portfolio. Um, and, uh, and, Jim took over. Um, I was one of the first people that he brought in to work in the magazine. And he brought in another, some other really, you know, great veteran journalists at that point. And, and, and he and the people that followed him built a really good journalism product over about four years. And, uh, and it's just too bad because this, this management team seems to be, um, you know, devastating that with their actions. The, the, the and, new ownership group, right? The new ownership group, yep. Right, when, right. Did, when did these guys buy the company? Well, it was four and a half, five years ago. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. and so weird, weird shit going down. Yeah, very weird. Yeah. Well, it, and, and, it's, 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 and it's... Sorry, go ahead. Yes. No, I was just going to say, I mean, ultimately, what my, my, my decision to leave was driven by two things. One is the editors that I like to work for were fired, um, and so I didn't really want to work for somebody else but also that whole everything that's going on around that um made newsweek a brand that i didn't want to be associated with any longer so yeah. that's just it, that was just i felt like it was just uh, toxic for me and i didn't want to be a part of it yeah i mean it, it had gotten so weird and then the other weird part for me is like i don't get your emails <laughs> like where you know i'm used to getting my kevin emails with like you know some very uh, thought provoking shit. You have a, your, yes, you have a writing superpower. I've, I've experienced it in a profound way. Uh, um, uh, but I think what makes that so incredible, Kev, is you have an ability to both synthesize things as well as see things that others don't or even see things at a, you know, to use your phrase from a different lens. And so even if I'm reading your shit about some shit that's fairly well known and others are writing and talking about, you know, it's a big topic, blockchain or whatever it is, I'm going to get something. It's just like the point on personal personal enterprise. It, you blew open a door and youpreneur and solopreneur and all, you know, yes, I, you know, understand all those things, but you blew open a door in my mind of thinking about how profound that is in the context of AI and blockchain and all the good shit that were a set of dots that I hadn't connected. I hadn't really thought about that in that way. And, but, and so my point is you do that over and over and over again. And so it's, yes, I, the writing is great because fucking AI. I look, of course I'm biased, but I'll never forget when you sent the first draft of uh, the start of play bigger and I read it and I couldn't even believe what you had done with all of our, you know, 
bits and pieces. All of our and, craziness. <laughs> all of our craziness. Yeah, he's like, wow, you got that out of that visit, eh? Wow. <laughs> Shit. All I remember about that visit is I had sucked getting up. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and, uh, but then I had this moment, Kev, where I, I, was, I, I thought, wow, the whole fucking book's going to read like this. So, yes, it's a writing talent, but what makes it, you know, what the one-two punch is, is, yeah, I mean, uh, this is, may sound corny to you, Kev, but you have a magnificent brain. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Chris. <laughs> yeah, I love your brain, man. <laughs> well, I've enjoyed yours, so. <laughs> I don't know what we do with that. It sounds getting to sound a little Things weird. Things are getting weird. It's probably time to end. <laughs> Kevin Maney, I fucking love you. Thank yeah, you. Chris, thanks for, thanks having for me writing on. this book, man. This is a good book. Thanks a lot. All right. We'll thanks talk soon, you. brother. Absolutely. All right. Enjoy. As always. Be legendary, <laughs> as I know you will. <laughs> okay. Talk to you later, Chris. Whew. Kevin Maney, incredible. Uh, and I'm so excited and empowered uh, just at the ideas in this book. And uh, particularly, as we talked about, the final chapter in Unscaled blows me away because it really speaks to how um, you and I as individuals and small entrepreneurs and solopreneurs can take advantage of all of this uh, new technology in this unscaled niche down world. So I highly encourage you to pick up a copy or a couple hundred of unscaled wherever you buy legendary books. And if you know somebody who would love this episode with Kevin, why not share it with them right now? And we would love you a little bit extra if you shared this episode on social media with all your friends. Now, in business, not knowing really sucks. Uh, you got to know where your sales are. You want to know where your orders are. You got to know where your cash on hand is. You got to have ac accurate insight into revenue, expenses, and generally what's going on. And, uh, you know, getting the answers to those questions can be incredibly hard, uh, but not today. You can get all of the critical information that you need to power your entrepreneurial business on your phone instantly from our friends NetSuite, um, uh, NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the cloud-based business management platform that gives you real-time visibility into all of your business operations. You can think of it as your one source of truth for revenue, expenses, customer information, order information, and even updates on what's going on with your people and your HR. It's super easy to use. You have these unbelievable NetSuite dashboards that uh, even mere mortals can, uh, can cope with. <laughs> and that's why some of the fastest growing entrepreneurial businesses on planet Earth use Oracle NetSuite every day. So this month, our friends at NetSuite are offering a special to Legends and Losers listeners to kick off our relationship, a free 60-minute business review with a growth expert in your industry to help you turbocharge your business. To check it out, go to netsuite.com forward slash legends, and you can set up your uh, discussion, your dialogue with a NetSuite growth expert today. It's good to know things, and now you do with NetSuite. And um, also... We would like to thank Unscaled, the amazing new book, How AI and a New Generation of Upstarts Are Creating the Economy of the Future. HarperCollins Instant Classic, Play Bigger, How Pirates, Dreamers, and Innovators Create and Dominate Markets. Our good friends at Equity Directory, connecting startups to the talent and resources they need. Check it out, equitydirectory.com. OneLifeFullyLive.org, the nonprofit committed to helping you dream, plan, and live your best life. Check us out, OneLifeFullyLive.org. PursuingResults.com. If you want to get into podcasting, if you're a thought leader, if you're a business and you want to differentiate yourself, but you don't have the technical capability, uh, check out our friends at pursuingresults.com. They produce legendary podcasts and this one too. And speaking of friends in the podcast business, Interview Valet. Interview Valet is where thought leaders go to get their leading thoughts on podcasts. You be the guest and they do the rest. Check out interviewvalet.com. And Kevin Maney's company, co-founder of Category Design Advisors. Check them out. They help entrepreneurial executives design and dominate their niche at CategoryDesignAdvisors.com. Now, we must remind you that this podcast is a sole property of the Legends of Losers Oddcast Network, and we would love you a little extra if you shared the shit out of it right now. All rights do remain disturbed. We must warn you, this podcast is clearly produced in a studio that does contain nuts. Teach kids technology. Remember, beer is proof that God loves us. There's no such thing as a participation award. Chill your nuts. Listen to the Ramones. 
It's okay. Go ahead. Pee in your wetsuit. And for the love of whoever you love, don't be lame. Get out of the passing lane. Thank you, Candy Dandy. I love you, Mom and Dad. And hey, Colin, this podcast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Today, our deepest apologies go out to Bill McDermott, Chief Executive of SAP. Sorry, Bill. We just ran out of time for you. That's it. We hope to see you again soon, friends, on another episode of Legends and Losers.